Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to stay up to date with what's happening here at Maranatha. There are plenty of opportunities for connection all throughout the year, and we want you to be aware of them so you can come and join in. If you have any elementary age children, we would love to have them in Venture Kids. It's exciting, it's secure, and we make learning about Jesus fun. Just register them in the Family Life Building before service starts. Have you tried coming on Wednesday nights? There's something for everyone in the family. It's a great way to grow as a disciple, to train your family, and to get a midweek refuel to get you to the weekend. Our youth group, Synergy, begins at 6.30. Everything else is at 7 o'clock. We hope to see you this week. It's almost service time. Please silence your cell phone. It only takes a moment and it could prevent distractions for your neighbors. It's a great day to be in God's house. Let's stand on our feet, clap our hands, and worship the Lord together. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Maranatha. If you don't know him yet, we got somebody we want to introduce you to this morning. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Come on now. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all is stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Yes. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sin that he can't save.
an offering of praise this morning. Lord, thank you for your saving power. Thank you for your mercy that reached out to me when I could not save myself. I was lost and undone without God or His Son when He reached down that great hand for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Lord a hand clap of praise. Will you do that? We welcome you on this, the first day and the first Sunday, a brand new year. Happy New Year to all of you. We're delighted that you're here. Those of you that are joining us by live stream, wherever you may be watching from, you're in attendance at Maranatha Rinkins Family Church in Rinkin, Georgia, and we're so glad to have you with us today. There's a number of needs, not only in the room, but outside these walls, there are folks that are not able to be here today. We want to remember these as well. And Father, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your power, for your might, for your love, for your compassion. There's just an endless list of that which we could thank you for. Lord, we're told in the song to count our blessings as impossible as it is to count them all. What a joy it is to realize all you have done for us. And now, Father, as we begin this brand new year, we pray for the life of this church, that it will be more powerful than it's ever been, that you will move, that souls are going to be saved, backsliders are going to be reclaimed, believers are going to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit, and needs are going to be met. We're believing you for that. We're decreeing that. We ask, Lord, now that you will guide us in all that we say and all that we do, that it will bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet some folks as you prepare to be seated. God bless you. You may be seated as we move on with our service this morning. Our ushers are standing by and coming at this time to receive our Sunday morning tithe, missions, and offerings. God bless you. As we begin this brand new year, we have given us, Pastor and I were talking several hours ago, I think already for last year it was somewhere around 200 and. $75,000 that was given to missions. Isn't that wonderful? Let me help you with that a little. We've gotten so used to these big numbers that we just come where we expect it. Now, let me say it again and you respond again. $275,000. There you go. <laughs> Amen. And we're not doing it for recognition. We're doing it to reach the lost. We appreciate all the awards and all the other stuff that is given, but that's not our motivation. If that was our motivation, we wouldn't waste our time. But it's to reach the lost for Christ. Thank you for what you're doing and for what you're going to do this year as well. Let us pray. Father, bless our giving and meet every need for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Maranatha, and Happy New Year. Thank you so much for choosing to begin your day in worship with us. Next Wednesday, January 4th, all services and activities are canceled. After that, we are back on schedule and off to the races. Next Sunday, Rudy and Sharon Swanepoel will be with us, and you do not want to miss it. He's a wonderful minister, and she is an anointed singer. So make plans to be here in either the 830 or the 1050 service. 
Our first WM meeting of the new year will be on January 10th at 6.30. There will be the usual food and fellowship, and there will also be ladies self-defense class. Make sure you come out and bring a friend. Thanks again for joining us today for worship. We are looking forward to what God has in store for us in 2023 as we continue to spread His gospel and His kingdom.
Good morning. Hey, let me tell you, Happy New Year, and I love you. This is the greatest church to pastor that I know of. I can't even think about pastoring somewhere else. And if that other crowd was here, I'd tell them. You know, that crowd is not here. The ones that are holy rollers heard the alarm clock roll over and went back to sleep. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Oh, it's a nasty day, and it's first day of the year, and everybody stayed up last night to welcome New Year in. I don't have a clue why. I didn't stay up. I didn't stay up to to welcome the New Year, but I did stay up to watch them aggravating dogs win. Waited for my general superintendent to text me last night. He chickened out. Oh, I hope he don't hear that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> hey, I'm glad to be here today, and I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, fresh New Year. Isn't it great? I love the turning of a new year. I love it. I love it because it gives me a second chance. It gives me an opportunity to rectify whatever in, in the last year has gone away. Uh, and for the 22 that we had and for the other last two or three years, I'm so glad to see a new year. I don't know what to do. I just hope it's a wonderful year. What's your plan for the new year? Have you made any? You know, it's funny to me that gyms will be full tomorrow. But people who's made New Year's <laughs> resolutions, and in about a week, they'll be empty again. It's because it's hard sometimes. I heard a story about a boy told his dad. He said, uh, Dad, if there were three frogs sitting on a limb overhanging a pond, and one of them decided to jump off, how many would be left? So dad said, Two. He said, no, that's not right. The dad said, there were three and one decided to jump off. Oh, I know, I know. You're trying to tell me that all of them decided once the first one did, they all jumped off. He said, nope. He said, I don't really understand. He said, well, Dad, if there were three on there and one decided to jump off, there's still three on there because... All he did was decide. He didn't jump. <laughs> Sounds a lot like last year's New Year's resolutions or new this year's New Year's resolution. Great inspiration, great resolutions, but oftentimes we only decide. Months later, we're still on the same limb of do nothing. So what about this year? Have you made any decisions about what you're going to do, what you think you might want to do, things you want to change about yourself? I have. I've made a few. Look at uh, the book of Ephesians now. If you turn to Proverbs, everybody knows where Proverbs is. It follows Psalms, right? Psalm, Proverbs, come to Ecclesiastes. It's that little book. Look at chapter 3. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Let me say that to Miss Teresa one more time. 
We did a little throwing away yesterday, I can tell you. She didn't do it by want to. Time to keep and time to throw away. Time to tear, time to mend, time to be quiet, and time to speak. I'm going to leave that one there. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I'm going to admit, I was going to read through 13. I think I'll quit right there. Solomon is telling us in this scripture, he's saying, God has a plan for us. You knew that, right? That God has a plan for all of us. And, and he also has a cycle for everything. In other words, not only does he have a plan for our life, but also those things cycle. You, you can't miss one or the other. And so everything that we do, we do in accordance to his will. To do all that our life demands of us, I think if anything this year, we have to find some balance in our life. I've decided that balance is the most important thing. And the older you get physically, balance gets off of whack. And you find yourself having to find new ways. I, I'm, I'm not super old. I'm 32. But um, <laughs> I, I uh, walk at, at three miles in the morning, and I find on the treadmill that I can't turn loose. If I turn loose, I wobble. <laughs> so I have to kind of hold on. I don't rest, but I hold on just for balance to keep up because it's hard sometimes. And life is hard because it takes balance. It takes, it takes us to figure out what works in our life and what purpose there is for it. And, and so when we need to get balance, and I think that we do, a good time to take inventory of that is the first of the year. So the first thing you have to do if you're going to have balance in your life is, is that you have to discover what your purpose is in life. I wondered about that as I get ready and was preparing for the new year and thinking about what to preach today is how many people understand purpose. You understand what your purpose is for being here. Probably over uh, almost 50 years of pastoring, that seems to be one of the number one questions people ask me all the time is, Pastor, what's, what, what I need to do in life? What's my purpose in life? What, what's God wanting me to do? It's always a question because we don't look for it in the right way. What is your purpose in this world? This is, I believe, the core question of all of our lives. If you've not thought very seriously about this, you, you probably haven't taken life very seriously because it's, you haven't figured it out. Many of, I, I believe that many of the problems, many of the problems that, that people in people's lives today could be settled if they, <coughs> excuse me, if they would understand their purpose in life and then lived in it. I believe we could, you'd have a lot less trouble, you'd have a lot less problems, you'd have people that, that wouldn't seem to be just up and down and out and in if they understood this is my purpose and this is where I've got to live in it. The Bible says, if we live, we live unto the Lord. And if we die, we die unto the Lord. Oh, listen to this. So whether we die, live, or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. Here's your purpose. You belong to God. That's not hard. What you do in your life is, is concerning how you want to live for God. I believe that, that if it's true that we belong to the Lord, then we have an obligation to live for God, to live for the Lord. The Word says to us, do you not know that your body, speaking of you, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. This is, came from God. 
You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. That's an important thing. Find purpose in your life. If, if I'm going to honor God with my, my body, I need to find purpose in it. I need to understand it's Him, and whatever I do glorifies Him, or hopefully glorifies Him. Our lives are not our own. They don't belong to us. They belong to God. Think about that. We go through this life thinking somehow we've been put here because God thought we was pretty special, and that's it. But God said you belong to me. The purpose of your life then is to glorify him. In fact, Scripture says work out your own salvation. People love that because <clears throat> they read it and go, there you go. I can do whatever I want to do if it works for me. But it doesn't stop there. It says work it out with fear and trembling. And then it says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. So now I have to understand that if I'm going to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, it is to glorify God. It is to do whatever I do in order to bring glory to God. So, you know, however, however I act or whatever I do, ever how my salvation comes out, it is not to make it glorify me, but to glorify God. It is because we belong to Him. Your purpose then is to live out and fulfill the purposes of God in my life. Now, if I really believe that, then it ought to affect everything that I do. Affect me on my job, affect me in my home, affect me in my uh, school or my neighborhood or in my church. It ought to affect me if indeed I am God's and my purpose is to glorify Him, then that's important. He's always working. God always, I believe from the time before we're born, because he said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you was ever born. I had plans for you. Remember that? Everybody learned that scripture one time. I have plans for you, plans for you to prosper. Why? Because God is saying, <clears throat> I already have a plan. I already have a time limit fulfilled for you. I already have all this stuff out there, and you need to work according to that plan. Fall and find in line with that plan. I believe that when you find that your purpose is to glorify God, you fall into that plan. I'm going to tell you, things in your life is going to change at that moment. I believe things are going to work better for you. I didn't say perfect. I didn't say that you weren't ever going to face a valley or a mountainside. But hey, I believe if you're following God's plan for your life, which is to glorify Him, things are going to be different for you. So I believe that it's my responsibility to cooperate with God's plan. His plan was for me to come to salvation. I ought to do that. I ought to, when I come to salvation, his plan is for me to glorify him. I ought to be glorifying him. It's to cooperate with his work inside of me. The Bible says, so whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do it all for what? The glory of self? No, the glory of God. So everything I do, every... Uh, Purpose in my life should be to glorify God. Somewhere along the line, we lost that. When you first became a Christian, it seemed almost uh, natural that you wanted to glorify God, that you wanted to be what God wanted you to be. And somewhere along the line, we lose that. But yet, the Scriptures remind us whatever we do, however we act, whatever it is that goes on in our life, ought to be to glorify God. If I do that, my life is going to be better. My life is going to be better. Teresa's life is going to be better. Everybody connected to me is going to be better when I learn to do that. So the grand purpose of your life then is to know God. First of all, know God and have an ongoing relationship with Him that brings glory to Him in a way that in the way that your life 
is lived out. In fact, the scriptures remind us, for we are God's workmanship. He made us, created us, built us, and gave a plan for us. In fact, before he ever made us, he already had a plan, like a, uh, we, uh, Ryan and Timmy and all, build houses. You can't just jump out there and build a house. You've got to have a plan. You say, well, they could build one. They're, they're pretty good at it. They could build one. But I guarantee you, at some point, they're going to have to sit down and draw it. And they're going to have to say, well, we've got to do this and this and this. So they've got to have a plan. Before you were ever made, Jeremiah reminds us, God had a plan for your life. And he wants that plan to be fulfilled all through your life. So when you become a Christian, you're falling into that plan. When you are living your life after Christ, you're falling into that plan. Your purpose then is to do that. Your purpose is to follow God's plan, to be a part of it. And if you don't understand what your purpose is, you just, you're not ever, you're building on the wrong foundation. And I don't care if your, life is, if your life is built on the wrong foundation. It doesn't matter how magnificent your life is, your structure is. It's going to crumble and fall. He reminds us of that story when he talks about the firm foundation and the, and the sand foundation. You've got to build on the right thing. What is the right thing? That I might glorify God in everything that I am and, and who I am and all that I do. So your primary purpose, I don't care what TV evangelists tell you, I don't care what the world tells you, your primary purpose here is not to be successful. Wait a minute now, don't get excited. It's not to have a wonderful career. Your purpose is not to be happy in your earthly accomplishments or to earn lots of money. Your purpose is not even to find love and have a family. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all of these things shall be added unto you. So my purpose, my grand purpose in life is to fall into plan with God, fall in behind God, serve God, love God, try to build God up in the sense with who I am, and then God says, I work all this stuff out. Now, I'm not telling you that they're bad. All this stuff is good. It's it's fine. It's not that they're all of these things that I mentioned to you are bad. They're not. It's just that they cannot come before the main purpose for which you were created. God didn't create you to have gazillion dollars, or maybe he did. But he first created you to follow him, to fall under his plan for your life, to know him and to glorify him and all that you do. And when you get that straight, then the rest of that stuff falls into place. I'm going to tell you, church, I believe today that a lot of the problems that are in people's lives, all of the things that are kind of a mess in people's life could be straightened out if they would say, God is first no matter what, no matter when, no matter where. My purpose is to glorify God. I was made in his image. I was made by him. I am his workmanship. Therefore, it's my obligation to glorify God in everything that I do. And I promise you, at that point, things will begin to happen in your life. If you're serious, things will begin to happen in your life for the betterment of it. So as you start off this new year, one of the things to get balance in your life is to stop and go, hey, I wasn't created to to be the most beautiful person in the world. I wasn't created to have this or that. I was created to glorify God. So everything that I do ought to do just that. It's a good thing, right? Second thing that you have to do to get balance in your life is that you're going to have to establish priorities. Now, 
you may have a firm grasp on what your real purpose is in life, and that is to, to glorify God. You may understand that your life belongs to God. You may believe that you are to live for Him rather than to yourself, but now you need to understand God's specific plan for you. I believe that every one of us have plans, that God has planned our life out. And the only way that that plan doesn't work is that when we get it off track, when we decide that we know more than God knows. Let me, let me give you an example of this. Some years ago, I was pastoring in North Georgia, I was running a lot of revivals. Man, I was doing revivals. My throat was going bad. I was in bad shape, but I was running revivals. Brother Branson, same way. We both were running a lot of revivals. People were calling us. I don't know if it was because we were good or cheap, but either way, we're getting a lot of calls, <laughs> and, uh, and we did a lot of revivals. And uh, church was going good. I had a great church, only second to this one. And... Uh, I got uneasy. Church had grown from like 50 to 250 or 220 in just in, in less than six months. I mean, it was doing parking lot full of people everywhere, sitting all in there. And it was doing good, but I got uneasy. And I don't know why I did. I don't know. I, I have some thoughts as to, to the particulars of it. But I came in one day and I'd been praying. Man, I was walking through the sanctuary, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. Sometimes you pray, but you need to be listening, you know? So I'm praying. Oh, God, I'll tell you, I need to do this. And the whole time I'm thinking, boy, you, you're preaching a lot of revivals. Maybe that'd be a good thing to do. You know, revival, evangelists, they kind of fly in and blow up and fly out. They, uh, everybody thinks they're wonderful, you know. They, they listen and pray, oh, my God, I never heard preaching like that. And you go, what am I, chopped liver? And uh, so I decided I wanted to do revivals. That, that was what God was calling me to do. And so I took off to preach revivals, and I'm preaching revivals here and there. And we go into town, and I'm, I'm doing all kind of revivals, and I'm thinking this is great. But something's not there. In fact, I'd been... Um, I'd been off from home for about, I remember, it was about like 30 days I hadn't been home. And I was way off in Arkansas, and I was preaching a revival, a friend of ours. And uh, we got through that Wednesday night with service, and he said, you going to spend the night? I said, no, sir, I'm going home. So I got in that little truck, and I left Arkansas, and I drove all night long. And finally got, and I, I stopped and bought crackers, drinks, and gas, and took off. And I got home, and I was so happy to be home. And I decided, this ain't you, boy. So I began to pray. And you know what's the truth? I hate to tell y'all, but I think I missed it. I love being a pastor. I love preaching to the same people week in and week out. I love seeing your face, hugging your neck. I love being around you. I love it when you come through that door. I love it. I love working with my staff. I love everything about pastoring that I didn't love about evangelistic work. I enjoyed it. It was okay. Got to see a lot of places, preached to a lot of people. But that wasn't me. And I figured it out. That was not God's plan for my life. That wasn't what God had called me to do. My calling was to be a, a pastor. So when I began to look at that, I began to ask myself, you know, questions like, what is your gift? Well, my gift was the gift of pastoring. I'm, I don't have necessarily the gift of administration. I do some things. But but my gift was pastoring. So I think the second thing we need to do is once we understand what God's purpose is for us, we have to begin to look at what God's priority, how God we prioritize these things in our life. We have to ask ourselves, what specific talents is it that God has given me and put into my life 
And then thirdly, how do I use these talents that God has given me and, and fulfill the purpose that he has for me in this world? I believe that a lot of people would be super happy if they would learn to prioritize and, and find what God, the purpose God has for their life, and then do it. The reason that these questions are important to me is that, or to you, may be doing good things, but you may not be doing the right things or the things God has in mind for you. Your area of interest may be the gift that God has given you to promote both growth and influence in his kingdom. God may have you where you're at doing what you're doing because that's what he knows will benefit the kingdom of God as it grows. So setting priorities, people, people get saved and they begin to try to figure out what they can do and what they can't do, what's sin and what's not, what's good and what's bad. The truth is, it's not about choosing what is good and bad. That's been settled when you come to know Christ and, and got his God-given purpose in your life. Priorities have to be set when the choice is between what is good and what is best. So God is calling you in this next year to figure out what is good and what is best. To look at your life and go, you know, I really need to focus my attention on what God is calling me to do. I was the happiest camper, and when I went back to pastoring, I was the happiest camper you ever saw because I was back doing what God had called me to do. It wasn't to do all of these other things. It was to set a plan to glorify God in my, in my purpose and in my priorities. So priorities have to be set between what is good and best in your life, what will be beneficial, and what will actually be God's given will for your life. He has made you with particular interest and skills. Boy, there's somebody in here that, that we need that, that you can do that job better than anybody else can. God's given you that, that, that talent. There are people in here that that God's given you the talent to really be what God wants you to be. You've just got to determine what that talent is and step into that talent. I've been amazed at Donnie. When he came here, we really had no musicians. In fact, we sang mostly with uh, soundtracks because we didn't have them. But the truth is we had them but they haven't stepped into their talent. Since he came and began to work with them, I've seen people with talent that I never knew had talent because now they're stepping into it. That's what I'm talking about. Church, there's nothing more exciting than stepping into the talent that God has given you. Some of you need to be doing something in this church besides just coming and going home. It, and it's not so we'll be blessed, but that you'll be blessed in doing what God has called you to do and becoming what God wants you to be. I don't know of anything more miserable or would be for me. Getting saved Understanding God's purpose for my life is to glorify Him and then just sit on my hands. I wanted to do stuff. I, in fact, I wanted to do too much. At one time, I told people that when I first got saved, I, I was teaching a, a high teen Sunday school class. I was youth leader. I was uh, assistant pastor to Brother Nams, none of which I got paid for. And uh, back then, nobody get paid, including the preacher. I did all of those things. In, in fact, I, I stayed so busy, I even, I even helped a Tuesday morning women's prayer service. I just wanted to do everything. But there comes a time when you need to prioritize. What's, what's good for me? What's good for God? What's going to help the kingdom? What's going to... You have that talent in you. I just want you to know that, that some of you have that kind of talent. You need to find out what those, what those talents are, what's best for the kingdom of God, 
and then and do that. He's given you particular interests and skills and gifts. Use those gifts for the kingdom of God. Go in the direction of your interest and your, and your gifts because this is how and why God has created you. He didn't make another person just like you. You are unique. You are particular to his plan for your life, and he's got something he wants you to do. So, you, boy, I can see y'all just getting excited. Glory to God. They're like, I don't want to do anything. Just leave me alone. Let me sit here. I don't want you to do that because you'll never enjoy the purpose that you were created for. Do you not understand that? God created you. You're his. He made you. You're his workmanship. And he's got particular things that he put in you that I might not have in me that he wants you to use for his kingdom. You say, what are they? We think of all the other things. I need to preach or pastor or evangelize or whatever. No, no, no. These can be anything. Uh, Sister Barnhill, many of y'all, some of y'all know her, many, many may not know her, but she was one of the most, she was Randy's grandmother. She was one of the most wonderful women I knew of. And uh, her ministry was keeping the nursery. She absolutely thrived in that environment. She loved, I, I'm going to tell you, your child would have never been taken care of any better than this woman would take care of her. She loved them. And in addition to that, she cleaned the church. That was her ministry. That was her talent. That was her calling. And she was great at it. It doesn't have to be some huge thing. You have to figure out, what is the talent that God's given me and how can I utilize that to build the kingdom of God? And so you, it's about getting the most from your life, setting priorities, help you to trim down your involvement to a kind of a reasonable level, trying to do everything like I did in a, a church. That's, that's no good. You can't do it as good as what you can find if you look at your purpose and figure out what talent God has given you. When you don't have a lot of talent, it causes you to be a pastor. Third thing, if you're going uh, to have balance in your life, then you have to make a plan. You understand your purpose, you set your priorities, but you have to have a plan. How to make it happen. It'll never happen. Nothing is going to happen until you make it happen. Um, it's too easy in this life to let life sweep you along and your agenda be filled with urgent little things of the day. And if you're not deliberate in your planning out your life, your life will just kind of drift along and, and life will just happen. Just happening is not good enough. You want your life to happen on purpose. I remember years ago, our then superintendent who's dead and gone on to glory, Brother Zimmerman, preached a sermon. I heard him preach it. Man, it was powerful. But he talked about how that we allow our lives to just drift along in the current of the whatever's going on until we hit a snag or until we taking places we don't want to go. And that's what happens when you try to let life just happen. So God is calling us to make a plan. So here's my advice to you this, this as you begin this year, it wouldn't hurt you to get a piece of paper and sit down and go, what is my purpose? That's easy. It is to glorify God, to lift him up, to exalt him, do everything you can to build him in your life in Him. Second thing is to figure out priorities. I can't do everything, so what can I do? And list them out. And then thirdly, make that plan happen. That is, not just write it out and put it up, but write it out and follow it. 
use it to do whatever it is that God wants you to do. So if you can't get everything done, it's because you're trying to do more. Listen to me. You're trying to do more than God wants you to do. You can get so busy doing stuff that you don't do what God has planned for your life. Do you have just enough, according to, to what Ecclesiastes is telling us, you have just enough time to do what God wants you to do? Listen to Ephesians 5. It says in verse 15, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of your time, because the days are evil. Things are bad. We know that. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk. Now, it seems strange that he would put that right, right in the middle of these verses. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. What is he saying? He's saying don't get sidetracked with things that are not necessary. Don't get sidetracked with them. He, People start off and they start going and they, they get sidetracked with all these things that really don't make much difference in your life. Be filled with the Spirit because that's, the, that's where we want to be, listening to God. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and everything to God. The Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, here it is, Submitting to one another out of the reverence of Christ. Walking in the direction and plans that God has for us. I think it's an important time to sit down this year, right now, this day. First day of a brand new year. And write out your life purpose. Put your priorities down on paper. Make a plan to fulfill those priorities and then make that happen. It's easy to go, I'm going to start a diet, but it's always tomorrow. Or I'm going to the gym, but it's always tomorrow. Well, I can't today. I, I, I'll do it tomorrow. But tomorrow never comes. You make a plan, but you don't stick to it. You don't make that plan happen. Begin to say to no to some things that are trying to take your time and interrupt your plan and purpose for God. Make sure there's enough time for the important things. Make time for God. Make time for ministry to other people. Make time to fulfill what God wants in our life, which is to glorify Him and exalt His name. People, when they see you and know that you're a Christian, they ought to they ought to be happy to get to know you. They ought to be happy to be around you because you're that kind of person. You know, making a, a pie, not for me, singing a song, teaching a class, witnessing to your neighbor, writing a story, leading a group, going to with somebody on a jail ministry team, working with children, youth, or elderly, whatever God is leading you to do that's that's what he would like for you to do you know there was a somebody was talking about this one day and some old people were there and he said he said ladies you think you're too old for ministry he said there's young girls in this church that can't cook he said they don't even know how to make a buttermilk biscuit how can they get married and not make biscuits Said your job in ministry ought to teach them how to cook, how to make biscuits. I was saying, Amen. <laughs> you never know, a simple thing like that can bless someone. How many could teach a young couple how to have a happy marriage, how to live through difficulties? Your ministry will be unique to your personal calling and gifts. And you'll have time for God to use you because you have made a plan. 
So let me, let me close with this. Um, brand new year. Love brand new years. If this new year could speak to you, say something to you, here's what I believe it would say. Here I am, a new year. I am the unspoiled pages of your book of time. I am your next chance at the art of living. I am your opportunity to practice what you've learned about life during the last 12 months. All that you sought and didn't find is hidden with me, waiting for you to search it with more determination. All the good that you tried for and didn't achieve is mine to grant when you have fewer conflicting desires. All that you've dreamed but didn't dare to do, all that you hoped but did not will, all the faith that you claimed but did not have, these slumber lightly waiting to be awakened by the touch of a strong purpose. I am your opportunity to renew your allegiance to him who said, Behold, I make all things new. Brand new year. Brand new start. Old year's gone. Can't change one thing. But I can start today and say, Lord, you made me, created me to glorify you. I am not my own. I belong to you. So therefore, from this day forward, my desire is to be what you have created me to be. I'm going to do things that need to be done. And I'm not going to let things that don't matter get in my way. I'm going to make a plan, and I'm going to stick to that plan so that I can do what you want me to do. God may be calling some of you to do something in this church or even out of this church. And he's waiting on you to recognize your purpose prioritize your time and make a plan to accomplish it. I, I'm not kidding. There might be some ladies in here that just need a good old cooking class. There are some guys in here that need to learn how to change a tire or build a something. There are people that just need your touch. There may be somebody here that's struggling, going through a physical problem, who needs someone to lay their hand on them and say, I've been praying for you today, just so you know, I've been praying for you, and then begin to write this new year through. You know what my idea is today? Don't waste another year. When you get my age and a little older, you'll look and go, I wasted too many. I don't know about you. I can't afford to waste any more. And I need either jump off the log or quit deciding. I don't want to waste any more time. I've wasted enough. What's your plan? Father, I thank you today that your word helps us to understand where we are with you. Sometimes we forget. Someone said to me earlier, boy, that really hit me when you said, we are not our own, but we belong to God. And I pray that it does. I pray also that we'll get an idea of, it's just not good enough to sit around, waste time. It's not necessary that we do everything that we do, but that we do the necessary things that you want us to be. And Lord, I pray today for this congregation that we'll start the new year off in a right way. 
we'll start it off by doing what you've called us to do. Lord, make us what you want us to be, I pray. As our heads are bowed for just a moment, maybe you're here today and you just struggle because you don't know what it is God wants you to do and you struggle with it. And today you want God's clarification. You may, you may need his clarification in your talents, but you don't need clarification in his purpose. You are his purpose to glorify God. You are his purpose to glorify him. Your deal is to find out how to do that. You know, I feel like I ought to raise my hand today and say, Lord, don't let me waste another day, another breath, another moment. Let me do those things that matter, first to you and the kingdom, secondly to my church and my family. Let me be what you want me to be. Thank you, Lord. Pray for everybody here today. Let us leave this place today challenged to be what you want us to be. Oh, don't let the devil rob us of another day, another hour, another moment. Mm. Sing that we don't. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Let's pray together before you go. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday morning. Father, go with us now as we leave this house and go to our own homes. 
Give us a tremendous first week of this brand new year that will bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>